permanent committee of the House. person in the room and remotely using the zoom application a reminder that all comments should be addressed through the chair pursuant to Standing Order 1083G, the committee is continuing its study of Report 1, Arrive Ken, uh, which came to the committee on Monday, February 12th, 2024. Officer of the Auditor General, Karen Hogan, Auditor General of Canada, Andrew Hayes, uh, Deputy Auditor General, Sammy Hanouche, Principal, Lucie Desprez, Director. I should know them all by heart. You've been in for the last couple of meetings, and I appreciate your availability both last week and this week. Uh, from, from the Department of Public Works and Government Services, Michael Mills, Associate Deputy Minister, uh, Dominique Laporte, Assistant Deputy Minister, Procurement Branch, uh, Catherine Coulin, Assistant Deputy Minister, Department Oversight Branch, Wujo Zelonka, Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief Financial Officer, Finance Branch, uh, and the two lead groups will each have five minutes. Ms. Hogan, you'll lead us off for five minutes. And after that, Mr. Mills, you'll have five minutes. So without further ado, Ms. Hogan, over to you for five, please. Monsieur le Président, merci de nous inviter à nouveau. Mr. Chair, thank you for inviting us again to talk about the Arrive Can application and its report, which was tabled on February 12th last week. I want to recognize that we are on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. We will be studying uh, if this audit, uh, which I will limit my comments to the role played by PSPC Canada. The minister, or the department rather, had to administer contracts in the name of when the value of a contract went above the uh, amount. That we realized that PSPC had. We found that PSPC challenged the Canada Border Services Agency's use of non-competitive processes, and it recommended alternatives such as shortening the duration of non-competitive contracts or running competitive processes with a shortened bidding period. Despite this advice, the agency moved forward with non-competitive approaches. I also reported that the Canada Border Services Agency's overall management of the contracts was very poor. Essential information was missing from awarded contracts and other documents, such as clear deliverables and the qualifications of required workers. We found that contrary to Public Services and Procurement Canada's supply manual, the department co-signed several task authorizations drafted by the Canada Border Services Agency that did not detail task descriptions and deliverables. Without this information, it is difficult to assess whether the work was delivered as required and completed on time while providing value for money. Public Services and Procurement Canada also co-signed many of the agency's amendments to task authorizations. Some amendments increased the estimated level of effort or extended the time period without adding new tasks or deliverables. This drove up the contract's value without producing additional benefits. To deliver value for dollars spent and support accountability for the use of public funds, the Canada Border Services Agency and Public Services and Procurement Canada should ensure that tasks and deliverables are clearly defined in contracts and related task authorizations. Mr. Chair, this concludes my opening statement. We would be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Auditor General. And I'll turn to Mr. Mills. You have the floor for up to five minutes, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I begin by acknowledging that I am appearing here today on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Peace. Uh, we welcome the tabling of the Auditor General's report into the development of the Arrive Can app, and we look forward to our discussion today. I'm joined today by my colleagues Wojo Zalanka, Chief Financial Officer, Dominic Laporte, Assistant Deputy Minister of Procurement, Catherine Poulin, Assistant Deputy Minister of Department Oversight. 
Speaking as one of the key senior officials responsible for procurement, I want to acknowledge the complexity of the federal procurement system and recognize the immediate need to make improvements, particularly where we require professional services. The Auditor General's report makes one recommendation that implicates the PSPC, namely that PSPC and CBSA should ensure that tasks and deliverables are clearly defined in contracts and related task authorization. This is particularly a key for PSPC as it speaks to the division of responsibility between PSPC and client departments. SPAC est l'acheteur central du gouvernement fédéral. En cette qualité, il s'assure que le ministère. In this role, PSPC establishes and administers central procurement tools in order to fulfill their mandate. PSPC is the government's central purchasing agent, ensuring departments and agencies have the goods and services necessary to deliver on their various mandates. Client departments and agencies can access. Uh, procurement tools directly. We know there are concerns as to how the procurement instruments associated with RIVCAN were used. This committee that we have already introduced several new control measures that start to address the observations of both the Auditor General's report and also build on the Procurement Obvins report. In November 2023, SPAC or PSPC wrote to all departments, including CBSA, suspending all delegated authorities to authorize professional services based task authorizations. In early December 2023, PSPC provided direction to its procurement officers to ensure that the task authorizations include a focus on clear tasks and deliverables. Federal departments must now formally agree to set a set of terms and conditions to access access to select uh, professional services methods of supply. Key changes also include the use of new contract provisions to increase costing and subcontractor transparency and provide important clarifications on the role of departments when using these instruments. The intent is to improve consistency in practices. PSPC is also updating its guidance to aid departments in procuring effectively and responsibly when using procurement instruments under their own authorities. Le rapport de la vérificatrice générale, tout comme l'examen de l'ombud de... The Auditor General's report, along with the Procurement Ombuds Review, underscores the need to strengthen specific areas of our procurement processes related to professional services. We will continue to build upon the actions we've taken so far and focus on a path forward to improve training, procurement process and practices in order to optimize various uh, outcomes for Canadians. Thank you. And we thank you as well. To round the question, uh, Ms. Block, you have the floor for six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and welcome to all of you who are joining us today. I'm, of course, subbing in as the Shadow Minister for Public Services and Procurement. I want to go directly to the Auditor General's report where she acknowledged that CBSA was engaging PSPC on the development of ArriveCAN. This is correct. Mr. Chair, PSPC was engaged to put in place contracts for IT services. How often were you engaged with CBSA on this project in particular? Um, in terms of our understanding, the department was involved in both putting in place new contracts and issuing task authorizations against 31 contracts. So how often would you have communicated with CBSA on this project? At my level or as a department? As um, a department. I think in the early early um, 2020, our procurement officers would have had fairly frequent interaction with their CBSA counterparts to put in place the initial set of contracts. Thank you very much. When did you first learn about GC strategies getting contracts on ArriveCAM? Um, myself personally, I, I would I would have said probably later in 2020 when I would have seen a kind of consolidated report around contracts for COVID efforts. Just Ms. Buck, I just want to interrupt for a second. Um, I'm going to remind all the witnesses that you're here speaking on behalf of the department. This is an issue I've noticed where people are kind of 
personalizing answers and we're looking for departmental answers. So just if you could just bear, bear that in mind, I just want to flag that early at the outset. Uh, I think it's important that that we get kind of the most fulsome answers possible about contacting communication. So if, if you can, if you could just uh, kind of uh, I apologize, respond Mr. to that Chair. Thing. So uh, certainly the procurement officials would have known immediately that there was a contract being put in place with GC Strategies, which would have been in the spring of uh, 2020. Thank you very much. And thank you for that, uh, Chair. I will frame my questions as such as well. Did PSPC raise any concerns about GC strategies prior to the contracting costs becoming public? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. To, to my knowledge, the questions were asked in terms of what was the rationale for choosing uh, GC strategies? Why? why we're, would CBSA looking to have a sole source contract? More about that, not a, so much as a criticism of the firm, but more trying to understand um, why, why use, the use of a non-competitive contract was required. So I'm hearing that there were not any concerns about a two-person company being awarded a contract of this magnitude. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, as as I understand it, they there was not concerns raised around GC strategies as they had previously provided IT services and were a, already on existing supply arrangements with the government of Canada. So is it common for the government to contract two-person companies working out of a basement receiving millions of dollars in government contracts? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. When we establish supply arrangements and standing offers, uh, there's a requirement for companies to demonstrate that they have provided services and in particular a certain number of contracts and a certain volume of kind of IT services in the past and GC strategies and other companies to get on those instruments would have to demonstrate that they had, had met those capabilities in the past. I just want to push back a little bit on that answer. It is my understanding that GC strategies has no expertise in IT. They do not provide those services. But what they do is act as a middle person to find those resources. So I'll just leave that there. So is PSPC satisfied? Was were you and are you can do you continue to be satisfied with the selection of GC strategies for this project? Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, kind of look at it from the perspective of they were engaged to do work. There was work that was completed. There was an application that was built. Uh, I really wouldn't be able to talk to the quality in, in their delivering on tasks and, and on the specific pieces, but we do, are aware that they did actually engage IT professionals and those IT professionals were able to build an app and to uh, do new releases and make sure that that app was available on multiple platforms. Thank you very much. My final question for you, are you familiar with the term bait and switch. This is something that was raised by the procurement ombudsman and uh, certainly a prevalency in the practice of procurement. Are you familiar with that term? Um, Mr. Chair, yes, I'm familiar with the term. Okay, so understanding that typically um, it would be where a company uh, identifies certain resources that will be working on a project and then changes them out for other resources that may not have the same level of expertise or skill. So, uh, Mr. Chair, what I what I can say is it is not uncommon for there to be a time gap between the time when companies have to make their submission as part of a procurement process and when a task authorization is issued for a piece of work, particularly for multi-stage IT projects. So in those cases, there may be resources that are available at the time of bidding that would be willing to do the work there can be a passage of time before you get into a later stage of a project where you need to engage those resources and they're no longer available because there's been a length of time. So I'll quickly ask, are you aware that in the task authorization forms, resources may be used that don't have the same level of expertise as initially identified? Mr. Chair, under the procurement process and the rules, it is possible to replace a resource, but you are to replace them with someone of equal or greater skill and, and technical capabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next we have Ms. Yip, you have the floor for six minutes, please. Thank you for coming yet again. Um, so 
Mr. Mills, in paragraphs 1.51 and 1.52, the Auditor General points out that PSPC did challenge CBSA for when the agency indicated it wanted to pursue non-competitive processes for ArriveCan contractors, but nothing came out of that. The CBSA ignored the advice to run a competition. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Let's start with your role in the process and uh, what are PSPC's responsibilities in ensuring other departments follow proper procurement procedures? Thank you for uh, the question, Mr. Chair. Maybe I'll ask uh, Dominic Laporte to explain kind of how it works. So basically, uh, our department is is there so work with the client, the business uh, owner, so to provide the contractual vehicle that uh, will work and that will operationalize their their requirements. So, uh, and the, the case uh, at hand, so uh, we have basically a supply arrangement, uh, and task authorization were issued uh, against that. So basically, it's up to the client to define their need, their requirement. And for us to work with, with the client to make sure that we find the right contracting vehicle and also that we provide advice in that, uh, that regard. So uh, depending on the situation, competition is, is the norm. Uh, and we're going to have also, we have to exert that, uh, that challenge role and function. Okay. And what about ensuring other departments follow the proper uh, procurement procedures? So it's if it's within. Uh, thank you for the question. If it's within our authority, uh, we we have to to work with the client and to play that challenge uh, function. So uh, of course, it's something that we we do. Is it unusual for PSPC to offer this type of advice to other departments and agencies? Uh, in the context of the, the current contract, uh, this is the type of advice that, uh, you know, our procurement officers should be providing. Uh, they should be playing that challenge uh, function, and it's what we expect from our procurement staff. Is it usual that when a recommendation is made that it is ignored? Uh, on, on that one, I'm less familiar with the department. I started in my role with Liz recently. Uh, Thanks. Um, Mr. Chair, what I would say is, as the Auditor General's report points out, there's not documentation about why the CBSA ultimately chose to pursue a non-competitive vehicle. So I think here what, what is kind of at issue and what we're trying to look, look to the future on is ensuring that there's well-documented rationale for why the choice of a particular um, appro procurement approach was pursued. Um, we are one point of advice. Uh, there are other factors that were likely considered, but we unfortunately don't have the documentation to understand why the decision was ultimately taken. Where would other points of advice be given? Um, market availability, potentially, um, potentially constraints within a department systems that you can only use certain firms to actually move quickly on availability of resources. There could be a number of factors. Um, is this an area that you believe that PSPC requires more oversight powers or authority to guide other departments from making mistakes? Thanks for the question, Mr. Chair. I'm not as much sure if we need a more oversight, but definitely what we need to ensure that we do have evidence and we do have that documentation that actually decisions are being taken at the appropriate level that they're being documented and just and there's proper rationale and justification for why a, a particular approach is taken before we proceed. Mr. Laporte, do you have any comments on that question? No, I think it's well it's something we want to work with with our staff uh, you know to make sure that they've got the tools uh, to perform that challenge function and also one of the, the initiatives that we're continuing the implementation is our e-procurement solution so uh, in the past, what was happening is that you could have all sorts of documents being filed different ways. You could have CD, hard copies of documents, emails. So we've been deploying over the last few years a new e-procurement solution that will basically document all the interaction that contracting uh, may have with suppliers, with clients. So that will go a long way uh, to address some of the issue, the very issue in terms of the the lack of records. So uh, all the question being asked, being documented as, as part of the same electronic platform, this is something that we're pushing. And I have to say that uh, close to $6 billion of contract, we're basically uh, using that platform. So, uh, so we've made great progress uh, over the last few years on that front. And, and increasing your supervision over the contracting? Uh, 
Thank you for the, the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, as the Deputy Mills pointed, sometimes also we our role is to provide the advice and we're not necessarily always, uh, you know, we, we trust the client to make the right decision in light of the specific challenges, circumstances that they are facing. Uh, and we can provide the advice, but ultimately also it's, it's rest with the clients to decide, is it an urgent requirement uh, from their perspective that would justify a non-competitive approach? Okay. Uh, to the Auditor General, an observation in your report indicated that PSPC challenged the CBSA and encouraged the agency to run a competition, even a short one, 10 days, uh, but the CBSA didn't follow that advice, uh, which was one of the main problems here, um, but it wasn't recommended in your report that PSPC have more authority to compel departments and agencies when it comes to contracting. Uh, why is that? I think it comes down to uh, the accountability of the party actually um, entering into the contractual obligation. In this case, it would have been Canada Border Services Agency, and they ultimately are accountable for the decisions that they make. I think the more um, you funnel everything through one department, the slower you will slow down. You, you will slow down procurement. And um, PSBC's role is to encourage competition and to follow the the many rules that exist in procurement, but the ultimate decision rests with the department that um, makes makes the final call. And in this case, it would have been CBSA. Thank you. That is your time, Ms. Ship. Uh, maintenant, c'est Madame uh, Sinclair Degagné. Vous avez parole pour. On to Ms. Sinclair Degagné for six minutes. Thank you. From the start, I'd like to say that in my career, I have uh, audited procurement systems, multilateral companies, governments, and if I must summary the role of a department such as your own, it would be as such. First, you must have processes in place, but second, you have to have follow-up in order to make sure that those processes are respected. Otherwise, the very first mandate, which is to have processes, is completely useless. Here's what we realize when reading the Auditor General's report. PSPC failed to respect its own mandate on many levels. They co-signed contracts that did not respect the processes. And I'd like to come back to a very important issue, which is to question the decision of the CBSA when giving a, a non-competitive contract. I'd like to know more details. Who emitted those warnings? At what level? Who were they, uh, were they given to? And I would like to know more about the content of the emails. If you can't answer clearly now, I need to have access to those emails, please. Merci pour la question, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Thank you for the question. Unfortunately, I don't have access to the information with me here. I do understand that uh, the uh, director was uh, CC'd, but I would need to uh, supply that information to the committee. So can you please uh, send it to us? Yes, indeed, I'm taking note of that request. Thank you. Donc, pour... Let's continue in the same line of questioning. In the report, it says that PSPC co-signed many contracts. When you co-sign a contract, yes, the Auditor General, as she just said, the, ultim the ultimate decision is the clients, so the departments, but you are co-signing and therefore there is a certain responsibility with that signature. In that case, you took on that responsibility and you shared it. You shared the responsi responsibility of, of offering contracts in a non-competitive way to a company that if you look at their website for even two minutes, you understand that it's just two people who uh, don't actually provide a real service. They're just uh, taking up a part of the market. Do you think this is normal? As mentioned, our department played its role vis-a-vis -vis the CBSA. There, there were risks and the approach uh, taken on by PSPC was competitive. As was said by the Auditor General, the decision is ultimately the client's decision. And so we need to uh, 
understand that context. Indeed, there were some gaps and we have taken stock of that. We always have to have more training and uh, with our uh, staff, but there are, of course, some lessons uh, to learn. Well, yes, we've been hearing that over and over again, with all due respect, all departments are saying that uh, about this uh, calamitous report. Sure, learn from your lessons, but this is not a small mistake. This is a repeated mistake that happened over a number of years. And we've learned that GC Strategies has had uh, contracts from multiple other departments. They have uh, earned $250,000,000 uh, $250 million in earnings, and uh, they just had multiple contracts. So this is not a, just a simple mistake. Somebody at PSPC closed their eyes, or a few people closed their eyes. They allowed processes that were not respectful of um, the usual processes to take place. So it was one or the other. Either one closed their eyes in a negligent way or in an ill-meaning way. Which one is it? Because in both cases, somebody closed their eyes. Thank you for the question. I think that the department has a lot a very high volume of contracts. There's a, it's not a, an excuse at all, indeed. Must we have stronger processes in order to make sure that we have learned the right lessons and understand why those authorizations were signed? Yes. And as the uh, as Deputy Minister uh, underlined, we also did send out uh, warnings to our personnel. So there were measures that were put in place in order to avoid this kind of process. So you're telling me that in the future, if there are task authorizations sent out that are too flexible and allow for too high, um, uh, to, for too high, too much money, and if there are se selective and biased uh, processes where there's no value for money, and the uh, technical aspect is valued, but 76% of the contracts, as uh, is written in the Ombudsman's report, the indicated resources in the, pro the proposal are not used. You are gonna you're telling me that this will never happen again, uh, like a miracle? Thank you for the question. The measures that were put in place are very strong ones since uh, November 28 by our department. A lot of work has done. We've been raising awareness with our clients and our personnel and staff. There are task definitions that are strong and I they're not vague. So I think that I, it would be uh, shocking to see this happen again. We will not stress uh, uh, we will not uh, emphasize the importance of a CV as much, for example. So we will be looking at the uh, a company's uh, pedigree. So there is a lot being done. And on to uh, Mr. Desjardins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank the witnesses for your attendance here today. We are, again, looking at and reviewing the Auditor General's report in regards to Arrive Can. We've heard previous testimony from the CBSA and from the Public Health Agency of Canada. And both, of course, have submitted information to this committee about their narrative of how this was able to take place. We've heard continuously that at several at several moments, there were checks and balances that failed, including a challenge from the PSPC that amounted in CBSA not actually undertaking that work. In addition to that, we've seen CBSA also participate by way of con by signing the contractual obligation by way of its executive director of the Business Application Service Directorate. And so PSPC, although I, I feel at times may not be getting as much attention as this issue deserves, I think is actually central and core to the rot and the root of what this problem really is. And I want to preface this by my position that I've, I've been very clear in my review of this information that there is one a failure in good management. That this is a, a credible issue that has been established uh, within this report. Two, it did not deliver the best value for the taxpayer dollar. We know that very clearly. We know taxpayers uh, feel as though, and particularly the Auditor General's credible evidence here suggests 
that this is not good for taxpayers, the way that we were able to rely, for example, on external very expensive contracts versus upskilling their public service over a period of time that was very possible to be doing over the course of uh, eight years and even previous to that. We, of course, then have another failure, which is to support, support the public service writ large. We know that when austerity takes place in Canada, when we see our public services take a hit for this work, we see a vulnerability begin to build. This vulnerability is largely in today's 21st century reality in IT contracts. IT contracts are very difficult to for the government of Canada to obtain. That's something we've heard very clearly from the CBSA that they felt they must rely on external contractors. And I'll point to the evidence submitted by the Auditor General, page seven, under the findings of uh, 1.28 in the English report. And I'll quote, the Canada Border Service Agency determined that it would need to rely on external resources to develop the web-based mobile application because it did not have sufficient internal capacity with the skills needed. It continues to say, we found that as the Auditor General's office, at the time went on, the agency continued to rely heavily on external resources, and there's an, a, an exhibit there, 1.2, reduced reliance on external resources would have decreased the total cost of the application, enhanced value for money. To Mr. Mills, knowing that our public service, particularly in this instance at CBSA, was unable to secure the necessary labor to do this work internally, this is something that was well known and well established by the public service and procurement Canada, even previous to this audit, we have heard several times that this is a vulnerability. Why is it that it takes uh, an egregious affront to Canadian taxpayers to have this issue taken seriously? At what point do you, Mr. Mills, raise the alarm to the deputy minister and to the minister responsible to say that we have a credible vulnerability to the public service, that this credible vulnerability is leading to a situation where outside private contracts are not only abusing their ability to, to secure government contracts, but at times they're actually, as one of my colleagues mentioned, bait and switch these uh, assignments, where they're then allowing themselves to absorb not only the contract, but then to then, in addition to that, change the rules of those contracts to absorb more resources, and at times for skill, that it can be replaced by the public service. There should have been a reduction of that reliance. And I point to that exhibit on 1.2, where that reliance actually increases since the onset of the project. This, Mr. Mills, is very disappointing to taxpayers when they know that these efficiencies are not being met. How is it, or when will you, speak about the urgency of the critical underfunding of our public service, the creation of the vulnerability that we have in IT service services internally, and speak to the dramatic external threat that is present to the government of Canada without these skills? It puts us in this position in my mind. What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Mills? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I have kind of two thoughts. Uh, the first one is last fall, the Treasury Board Secretary did issue new guidance to all departments to actually think and do more analysis on the requirement to actually contract out as opposed to using internal resources and to make a harder case for why they need to go out. And I, and I, what, did they, what did they say at that time? What was the response? Sorry, whose response to the departments? The department's response to that statement. When you when you was known to understand, we followed up in, in terms of our guidance in late November to departments to say before we actually do a contract, we actually want to see that analysis. We want to see a copy of that analysis documented so that we can understand why a department can't use their own internal resources. The second thing, which I think has been discussed uh, around this report, which is a very valid point, is as we're looking at transformation contracts and we're looking at a lot of these IT contracts, we actually need to build in a formal mechanism that has training, offboarding, and whatnot, so that while there's maybe engagement of external resources to build new platforms and whatnot, we do actually build up the internal capacity to maintain them, to adapt Why those systems. Why was that practice not met in this contract? Or, for example, the press said there's over $250 million in contracts that was awarded to GC Strategies. Why not, instead of this instance, or any of the instances of the prior eight years for the the incredible amount of over $250 million. Did that not become a standardized practice? Uh, thank you for the question. Mr. I, I can't speak to why and, and the last number of IT projects that the government of Canada said that it hasn't been there, but I can assure you that as we go forward, this is something that we're taking on in terms of better practice and best practice for managing IT projects in the future. Thank Where you. was the breakdown in your mind, Mr. 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 I'm afraid that, that is your time, but thank you very much. Um, being our, our second round, and just for witnesses, uh, there's six questionnaires per round. 
Um, Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning to the witnesses, and thank you for your attendance. To PSPC uh, representatives, uh, your Deputy Minister, Ariane Reza, was appointed November 2nd of 2023. Prior to that, she was the Assistant Deputy Minister. Beginning in August of 21, she was the senior official responsible for federal procurement. She oversaw 1,400 employees in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She led the urgent procurement of critical goods and services to ensure the health and safety of Canadians involving vaccines and surrounding protective equipment. She directed the development and implementation for the simplification of procurement practices. These efforts focused on building an accessible procurement system that drives value for money. Her DNA was all over the issues that we are studying today and have studied literally for the last couple of months. Why isn't she here? Thank you for the question. Um... Mr. Chair, uh, she had pre-planned leave for this week, and she's not available this week. Otherwise, she she and we were, was originally scheduled to be here last week, and the, the meeting was changed, so she was unfortunately unable to. Okay, thank you, Chair. I look forward to uh, a further invite to uh, to Ms. Reza to attend uh, this particular committee to answer some uh, relevant questions surrounding uh, these concerns. Now, on the bait and switch, to you, Mr. Mills. You've <clears throat> identified an understanding of bait and switch as presented uh, by my colleague, Ms. Block. I wanna do a little more pushback because prior to, uh, to Ms. Block bringing to your attention the real entity behind GC strategies and the business that they are in, you repeatedly used the phrase, well, they've been in you know, several government contracts providing IT services. That is so inaccurate. The uh, directors of GC Strategies themselves, the principals behind it, Christian Firth, made it abundantly clear on numerous occasions they have no expertise in IT. They are simply an external consultant who contracts with the Government of Canada to find IT professionals, which is really an offensive, offensive move particularly when you take a look at the size of the federal public service that Justin Trudeau has increased by 40% since 2015. Last year, in, sorry, last week uh, at the Ethics Committee, we heard from Jennifer Carr, the president of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada, who oversees our professional IT federal public servants, and they are rightly angered very angry at the government of Canada for simply bypassing their skills, their expertise in-house. You're certainly aware of that, are you not, Mr. Mills? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. I am, I'm aware that there is a debate about what is the capability of IT workers in the government. Um, again, in the use of external resources, many dialogues we've had with very depart various departments have indicated that there are lots of times when there are very specific skill sets that just aren't available within the public service. GC Strategies has no skills. There is nothing preventing from the government of Canada with this massive federal public servants to actually do Google searches on their own to find IT professionals. Why is it a two-person company working out of their basement is allowed to collect $20 million over the course of three years for doing absolutely nothing. If we were talking to professionals from the private sector right now, people would be fired for this. There would be accountability for this gross breach of the public trust. And I ask, I'm going to ask this question because I bet no one at the PSPC has been suspended with or without pay. Is that correct? Um, thank you for the question, um, Mr. Chair. I'll start with um, the first part about the use of external consultants is also used in the private sector. And I would note, we, I will acknowledge that GC Strategies, the two principles of the company, are, are their business model is to make available IT professionals. Move on. Now, on the issue of bait and 15, switch, okay, we've identified ahead. criminality, we've identified fraud, forgery, obstruction of justice, 
breach of trust by government officials, all, all, all surrounding the use of GC strategies and the contracting practices. Have you reported anything to the RCMP at this point? And why not if you haven't? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll turn to my Assistant Deputy Minister of the Oversight Branch. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're taking all the reports that we're getting very seriously. So we had access to the CBSA reports, the Aud Auditor General report. RCMP, yes Thank or you. No? We'll have to come back to this. Can um, she answer that question, uh, Chair? I'm, I'm afraid that the time the time is is well up, but there'll be many more rounds here of questions to uh, to come back to this. Uh, Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. Um, I want to continue on Ms. Yip's line of questioning there because she didn't quite finish uh, for the Auditor General. Um, she was discussing about, you know, the problem with, um, you know, the department not taking the advice of procurement services to, to have an open competition. And uh, you stated that the reason for that is the department, the contracts that with them is ultimately responsible. Um, but did you have anything to add on how this best oversight could be taking place? You didn't address it in your report. How can we fix this problem so that it doesn't happen again? So the procurement is saying you really should be doing an open competition and the department says, no, we're not going to. Uh, do you have any ideas as to how you could get around that blockage? I think uh, ideas like that are already outlined in um, the procurement policy and the supply manual that uh, Public Service and Procurement Canada has out there. I would tell you that every department should have its own or agency should have its own uh, procurement group or directorate who play a challenge function, should have some oversight over procurements. Then you also at certain contracting levels have Public Service and Procurement Canada that plays that role. But those supply manuals and the policies talk about, depending on the size or the magnitude, you could put committees together. There's a whole bunch of mechanisms already outlined. Um, that's why many of our recommendations are follow the existing policies. There's no need to create more. Oversight exists. It's a matter of actually putting it in place when it's appropriate. Okay, thank you. So that kind of leads to my next line of questioning that will be for, um, PSCP. So in the AG's report, she concludes that CBSA, PHAC, and PC, PSCP did not manage all aspects of the Arrive Can application with due regard to value for money. You've mentioned some of the steps that you have taken uh, since November to address the issues, but I would like you to elaborate as to how this is going to address costs. So let's start with the fact that you've taken away the delegated authority for task org organizations from all departments and agencies while new rules, agreements, and training is put into place. Can you elaborate on that, please, and specifically what it'll mean when the new agreements are in place? A couple pieces that I think are critical. The first one is uh, ultimately we're trying to simplify procurement to ensure that we have greater competition, which will put downward pressure on prices overall. With respect to these measures, we are looking at having greater transparency in the pricing. One of the uh, kind of issues that's been discussed at length is the use of subcontractors to subcontractors. And this part of this measure is to try and have clarity on where, where teams are actually using subcontractors to subcontractors and ensuring that we understand who's getting ultimately, what's the, the value that's flowing through to the IT professionals that are doing work versus profits and overhead. And also tightening up our ability to use price verification to ensure that we have reasonable rates even on the profits and overhead in competitive processes. So I think having greater competition will all ultimately drive down prices and greater visibility will uh, prevent the use of multi layers of subcontracting. Okay, so what would happen right now if CBSA were to come to PS, PC and say, we want to use the comp this particular company for general IT services, and we will issue task authorizations for specific projects later. Under Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Under the changes that we've made now, we would have to have a much stronger uh, justification of why under the kind of the criteria that's in the Treasury Board framework for using a non-competitive contract, that would need, first need to be done. Um, and I think there would be a lot more due diligence in terms of the justification and the articulation of the reason for why there's a need to use a non-competitive. Non 
then with respect to the issuance of the task authorizations, uh, we will need to have a much um, clear understanding of what the overall project objectives are, what the activities are, and the task authorizations will have to be very specific to what those activities are. The other thing that we're looking at is time limiting the contract. So a big part of what is um, what we found in the weaknesses here is that where there were task authorizations, the descriptions were general that allowed too much flexibility. This is actually trying to have clear, more clear articulation of those task authorizations, taking away that flexibility so that you know at the outset what resources are going to work on what types of activities, and then we can assess whether those activities were were um, delivered, and we can ultimately assess the price that was paid to deliver those activities. Thank you. I'm afraid that is the time on the spot. Maintenant, c'est Madame Sinclair Degagné. Now, Ms. Sinclair Degagné for two and a half minutes. Thank you. I'd like to hear more about the internal processes at PSPC. In theory. If there is an agent that notices that there are processes that are not respected repeatedly, what happens? Does this agent have the duty to tell their superior? Yes or no? We? Uh, oui. Yes. So when that advice is not uh, followed repeatedly, then it uh, goes up in the uh, levels and the hierarchy. So if that's the case, who in the organization was aware of the questioning that is present here in the Auditor General's report? Where did it go? What level did it go up to? Thank you for the question. According to the information that I've been able to receive, and of course, we will be providing those emails and uh, the names. It did go up to the uh, uh, CEO. Oh, and who is that? I don't know the name because I wasn't with the group at the time, but I can provide the information to the committee, but I don't have the information with me right now. Let's continue with the same line of questioning. In that case, if we know that the process is not being followed adequately, and the uh, department and client is not following the process, why did you co-sign and why did you accept part of that responsibility? Thank you for the question. The decision to proceed with the non-competition contract uh, awarding it, uh, falls upon the uh, client. And so you accepted to share that responsibility. There were authorizations of tasks that were co-signed later on, but I can't say what was co-signed by us. The process was followed according to the uh, uh, advice of our staff. They were given proactively and the ultimate decision to have a non-competitive uh, a contract uh, process was done for reasons that we're not aware of yet. To the Auditor General, was any of that signaled to uh, PSPC and still signed by PSPC? In the non-competitive uh, contracts, we saw that there was signing of contracts or task descriptions that were not clear enough. In my opinion, it does not follow our policies Yes, there is a certain responsibility that you take on when you sign a document. Thank you, Mr. Dejali, for two and a half minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I do want to continue now to the issue brought up by Madame Sinclair de Gagné, which was in relation to the contract requisition that was signed by the Executive Director of the Business Application Service Directorate. And so I understand that in addition to this fact, there was also a portion of P SPC's work that looked at challenging the non-competitive process that was undertaken by CBSA to award the contract to GC Strategies. At what point did that challenge, uh, at what point was that challenge made to CBSA and was that before or after the first signature by the Exec Director of the Business Application Service Directorate? Mr. Mills. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, we would have to validate the time. I don't have the, the timing sequence in, in front of me in terms of when 
when issues were raised or questions were raised about going competitive versus non. -competitive. Sure. Thank you very much, Miss uh, Miss Hogan. Maybe you're. team could shed some light on the order of precedence. Uh, thank you. We are aware that there was uh, a, an exchange of, uh, of emails in May 2020 uh, between PSPC and CBSA officials. And then at which point, oh, May of 2020, okay. And at which point under the this this title here, Executive Director of the Business Application Service Director, did this person in any evidence by the Auditor General's office, were they privy to the challenge that was made at that time? Yes, they were. How were they made privy to that information? Was it via email or were they part of the actual process to challenge the uh, Border Service Agency? The information that we've seen has that person um, on copy in that email. And at what point did at any moment that person raise any red flags or alarms in relation to the contracts they were signing? Not that we are aware of. Um, however, it might be for PSPC to provide additional information on that. PSPC, please. Thank you. Paul. Thank you for the question. I don't have the knowledge of uh, no uh, what what was what was done by the DG at that point. And do you think that the DG? would have or should have raised alarm? Again, thank you for the question. Uh, it's it's possible that the DG did raise some alarm. Uh, we don't just simply don't have the information to corroborate that uh, that fact. How do you not have that thank information? You. It seems like a credible. M Mr. Thank Dejay, you, you'll have another opportunity. We'll come back to you, I'm sure. Uh, turning now to Mr. Brock, you have the floor for five minutes again. Uh, Madame Poulin, I want to circle back to uh, my last uh, question to you. I. I I set it up in terms of uh, identifying various potential criminal charges that could be investigated. We've heard evidence directly from the source, Christian Firth, who openly admitted to committee members that he actually altered, changed resumes without consent, without permission of the resume, resume owners. That is a form of forgery. We've heard evidence of inflated invoices, again, by GC strategies, uh, subcontractors doing no work. We heard from the procurement uh, ombudsman that 76% of subcontractors perform no work, yet we're still receiving government monies, taxpayer monies. Missing documents, several, probably thousands of pages of missing documents as identified by the Auditor General. In fact, her point is, what, what's really concerning is what the audit does not reveal. And what it doesn't reveal is either, in my, my opinion, incompetence or corruption. Given all the red flags of criminality, of fraud, forgery, obstruction of justice, and breach of trust by government officials, have you made a referral to the RCMP based on all of the information you've heard to date? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So as you mentioned, we are gathering all the information that are put in front of us. This includes what has been said in that committee. It includes the conclusion of the report from the Auditor General. It also includes what we have heard through OPPO. We're gathering all that information and we are analyzing it right now. We need to see if the allegations are supported by other evidence. That's not your if job, ma'am. With all due respect, that is not your job. That is the job of our professional law enforcement officers. Your job is, if you have a suspicion of criminal wrongdoing, your job is to report that to the legal authorities. Clearly, you must have a suspicion of wrongdoing with respect to what's going on here in Arrive Can. Yes or no? We are doing analysis. And Do you have a suspicion, soon, As soon as we will find evidence in our documents. That's not that your job, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, that is not your job. You are not an agent of the RCMP. You are a public servant. I'll ask the question again. After everything that I've identified, everything that you have read in the AG's report, do you have a suspicion of wrongdoing? Yes or no? 
we have sufficient suspicion to Thank you. start. I'll move on. Thank you. Now, to you, Mr. Mills, I asked this question yesterday to officials at PHAC. Again, you're speaking on behalf of, of your particular department. During the course of the implementation of the ArriveCAN, the 177 different versions of ArriveCAN, were there regular and consistent communications between the deputy minister and the minister responsible for this portfolio? I've identified at least three ministers, Anita Anand, Philomena Tassi, and Alina Jazik. Were there regular and consistent communications between the DM and those ministers? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. During the first part of the pandemic, there were definitely regular communications between the deputy minister, senior officials, and the minister regarding the government of Canada's overall COVID response and procurements writ large in support of that response. Were there regular and consistent communications with the PCO, the Privy Council Office? Uh, there were regular uh, interdepartmental meetings um, led by the PCO again, discussing overall the kind of Government of Canada's response to COVID right. and procurement. And most likely interest. the person at PCO you were speaking with would be the clerk of the Privy Council who reports to the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Is that correct? Uh, thank you for the question, um, Mr. Chair. I I would have to take back to what degree our deputies were involved in the interdevelopment. There were certainly a number of um, ADM level committees that okay. were that were managed. And, and for the equation. Canadians out there watching this live or, or afterwards who are not familiar with the PCO, whose minister, which minister is responsible for the PCO? Uh, thank you for the question. The Privy Council Office would ultimately report into the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Those are the questions I have. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chen, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, among the common themes between the reports of the Auditor General and the Procurement Ombud is the lack of documentation. No written justification for many decisions, lack of specifics in task authorizations according to Section 1.69 of the Auditor General's report, many task authorizations several which were co-signed by Public Services and Procurement Canada did not include specific and detailed task descriptions and deliverables. I believe the Auditor General called it among the worst, if not the worst, bookkeeping she has ever seen. What is PSPC as the contracting authority doing to ensure that this documentation is appropriately managed moving forward. As I mentioned, we have uh, issued direction to all uh, departments and agencies that going forward, task authorizations will no longer be issued under their authorities. They'll have to be issued under the authorities of PSPC, and we'll have to ensure that when issuing those task authorizations, that they have much more detail on the specific activities and outcomes that we're trying to achieve with the work uh, contained. There is a community of senior designated officials across departments that are responsible for procurement. We are continuing to do engagement with that community to make sure they're aware of the, the new requirements. At the same time, we are also looking internally on training for all procurement officers to make sure that they are more aware. I think one of the things that has, has come to light from this part is the, the division of responsibility where the technical content of those task authorizations is to rest with departments. I think in many cases we were too deferent in terms of leaving the technical content to departments. What we take on is that we need to spend more time reviewing that and making sure that they're from a um, even a, a non-technical perspective that there's clarity what we'd say is reasonable clarity and uh, and consistency in the application of those task authorizations going forward my understanding is that there is an e-procurement system that will potentially be helpful. Can you outline uh, more uh, on how exactly this will be of use? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe I'll turn to Dominic uh, to talk a bit about the procurement system. 
Yeah, thank you for the, the question. So in the past, what was happening is our procurement officer would be receiving documents in different formats. It could be a CD, it could be a fax, it could be art copies, email. Uh, so basically, there was a myriad of way to communicate. So the good thing, the very positive things with the e-procurement solution that will be solving a lot of these issues is all the documentation, all the interaction between contracting authority and suppliers are taking part as part of a platform. So everything is basically recorded on the, the cloud. So uh, basically the issue that we face in, in the past, the, the likelihood that it does reoccur for procurement that are handled by PSPC uh, are very thin. And on top of that, we are also reinforcing training for staff. Deputy Mills alluded to that. Plus also some checklists that are gonna be mandatory for task authorization. So I have to say that you know these, these the, the 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 requirement to have clear task uh, was already uh, contained was already there in the supply manual. Uh, what we need is greater oversight and making sure that uh, there are procedure in place for that. Aside from more documentation, which would be very helpful, um, the cumulative effect of all the issues that has been identified by the Auditor General and the Procurement Ombud is that too much was paid for Arrive Can. Uh, while there were a number of non-competitive contracts, uh, there were also a number of competitive ones, but with high values. Uh, what is PSPC doing to ensure that we are paying a fair price for services that are being sought? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, as I've mentioned, we're doing a, a few things. Like our our core focus is to ensure that we make procurement simpler and more open for all businesses that can meet the goods and services requirements of the government of Canada. Increased competition will be the most important factor in driving down prices, ensuring value for Canadians. In addition to that, as I've mentioned before, we're trying to bring more transparency to how the work is priced within these contracts. And we're also expanding the use of our price verification tools so that we can, if we do have to, and, and there are legitimate cases set out in our policy framework to do non-competitive contracts, that we have greater transparency and, and more recourse to price verification to assure the price reasonableness in non-competitive contracts. Thank you very much. That is your time, Mr. Chen. I'm at now, say the Deputy Paulus, who's with the parole for it. Now, MP Paulus for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first question is for Mr. Mills. I'd like to understand why the government of Canada is dealing with a, GC, a company like GC Strategies as an intermediary, intermediary. Why are we paying a company that is subcontracting the work that is more costly? Why don't we have public servants who do that work in, instead? Is this a practice that is uh, common? Uh, with the government for the question mr chair i'll, I'll begin with uh, at the general level uh, departments will have identified that they do not have the in-house skills that they require so they will look to have an external piece under these instruments the they are looking for it professionals with certain skills and the competitive mechanism is open to firms that are structured like gc strategies as well as other firms that are integrated firms that would have it professionals with a range of skills and then they're no, and normally competed and whoever ends up having the most uh, skilled team at the best price would win the, the contract. Okay. So history demonstrates that these people had no particular skill set in, they just had the luck of having a contract with the government of Canada and that was uh, at the cost of $250 million. I'll continue. Uh, with the uh, Auditor General. With regards to surveillance, there is an organization, a department that is there to monitor things. Would you say that this is a case of corruption? Thank you for the question. As mentioned earlier, we are taking this information and allegation, these allegations very seriously, and we have certain information now within the department, and we are currently assessing everything. We do have a framework in place. I'm sorry to cut you off. I understand you, that this is a prepared response, but as a surveillance organization, there must be some of uh, your uh, staff that is uh, confused right now, uh, because right now for us, this looks like corruption. Is this uh, something that you're aware of? 
Thank you for the question. We are looking uh, into this and we're not ignoring any scenarios. We are taking the allegations very seriously. There are assessments in place right now. And if there is any criminality that uh, transpires, we will uh, refer to the RCMP. Is your organization also responsible of uh, making sure that no uh, emails disappear because we know that some people delete them and there are paper shredders that uh, are turned on. Do you have the power to make sure that that doesn't happen and to control that? Thank you for the question. It is not under my purview. However, every time we analyze uh, files such as this one, we do emit recommendations to uh, ensure that these kinds of things uh, are under our authority. Thank you. There's an elephant in the room right now. You talk a lot about the future. You know, you've had directives uh, and guidelines that were received in December and you'll change how things are done. But there are laws that have been in a place for a long time at the government, you know, even with the Treasury Board, there are contracts that are drawn up and the department's you know, make their purchases. But the president of the Treasury Board, Jean-Yves Duclos, who uh, at the time of COVID did have follow-ups and received questions on the contracts, Mr. Duclos always seemed to answer that uh, it wasn't really their responsibility. Ms. Hogan, as Auditor General, what is the responsibility of the Treasury Board in such a situation? During the pandemic, the secretary of the Treasury Board em emitted a letter to say that the PSPC, that PSPC could be a bit more flexible because of the pandemic and because we needed to react clear, uh, quickly. But the letter was clear to say that it was under the purview of every department to properly document their decisions and have a proper accountability process in place. In the current situation with RiveCan, there was a massive failure there. That documentation does, does not exist in order to ensure accountability to all Canadians. I would expect that the Treasury Board Secretariat ensure that in the future, if there is another such uh, emergency situation, that processes are put in place to make sure that those guidelines are properly uh, respected. We're talking about the future a lot, but we really should stay in the past. A brief question is what you have time for. No, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Is that me, Chair? Sorry, I missed that first part of it. Yes, it is, Ms. Clay. You have the floor for five minutes. Uh, thank you so very much, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today. And uh, I, I do apologize that you were not able to come in because of a, a last-minute cancellation um, in the last week uh, to have you appear. Um, I am hoping that you can help me uh, understand how procurement works. You know, first and foremost, I, I want to say how disappointed I am that that we did not take care of taxpayer dollars better that we really had a, a lackluster and, and a faulty system for, for, for procurement. And, and ultimately, it was taxpayers and taxpayer dollars that suffered from this. And I am trying to understand a little bit better as to, to how the pro, that procurement process works, uh, if that's okay. So, I mean, last week we we saw uh, some wide variations on the amount of money that GC Strategies has received in contracts over the years, and there there is confusion around how these contracts are reported to the government. Now, we also heard last week from witnesses that um, you know, in order to get a contract, you have to have that relationship uh, with uh, with uh, which whichever department it is that you're that you're trying to get a contract from. So if, if I can ask PSPC uh, very briefly to help us understand the difference um, between supply arrangements, between standing offers, task authorizations, and that whole like, and, and what do those relationships have to do with whether you get the contracts or not? And, and I also would like to know point blank if GC strategies or the people who have 
uh, now uh, take it over the name or change their name to GC Strategy if they were known to procurement uh, over the past decade? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Maybe I'll begin and ask Dominic to kind of jump in to fill in. So supply arrangements and standing offers are methods of supply to pre-qualify companies that are able to um, pr produce a good or service that's required by the government account. There are 11, I believe, uh, categories of supply arrangements that, that exist. So companies would, as I mentioned before, demonstrate that they have done like like projects, like services in the past at a sufficient volume of business that they would have the capability to meet the needs of the government. They would be pre-qualified on these uh, supply arrangements and standing offer. A department, when they have a specific requirement and it aligns with the kind of the areas of concern within those su supply arrangements would come to PSPC and PSPC would typically run a mini competition depending on the value sometimes those are there's 15 firms that are pre-selected from a uh, pre-qualified list of vendors if it's a large value contract it would be all the the competition would be run all pre-qualified vendors on it and then ultimately there would be a choice of the um, winning firm based on a combination of technical uh, evaluation and price evaluation the the i think point of reference here is that there's been a lot of questions around GC strategies. GC strategies was pre-qualified on supply arrangements. They had previously bid on a number of different um, pieces of work with different departments across the government. As people have mentioned, they had um, significant uh, volume of, of transactions. So they had competed in those and they had put together teams and had provided services for departments and agencies and had and from all kind of dialogue with departments and agencies, the IT professionals working under GC strategies were delivering activities and services that were amenable to the departments. In the case of ArriveCan, we are aware from CBSA that uh, they, they had previously awareness of GC strategies as a firm and were kind of proposing them as someone that they knew had the ability to put together a team that could actually meet their needs. So the GC so, Strategies non-competitive contract was not a contract under the supply arrangement or the standing offer, but the kind of familiarity with the firm was with respect to previous work done under standing offers and supply arrangements. So you're saying that GC Strategies or the people that are now currently known as GC Strategies had a relationship with the government in the past, and that is now kind of continuing on? So... GC, what I'm saying is GC Strategies, as been mentioned here before, are two individuals that have engaged IT professionals and with a wide range of IT background. And those professionals performed IT consulting services for the government of Canada. People Thank were aware that GC Strategies as a firm had had ability to assemble teams of IT professionals to meet the needs of government departments. Thank you very How much. How often do you do checks? Pardon? Sorry, I just had a very small question, nope. Chair, if you I'm, would allow. I'm afraid I'm, th there's more opportunities. I'm afraid that we're over the time. Um, I know members are eager to ask questions even after their time is allotted. I do like to hear the full responses from, from witnesses, but um, I, I, I don't allow questions after the time has elapsed. But I know you're, uh, you'll are you be up uh, again, Ms. Khalid, or you could sp share some time with one of your colleagues and get an opportunity to follow up. Madame Sikla Dengay, vous êtes prêt pour deux minutes, s'il vous plaît. Madame, Ms. St. Clair de Gagny. Thank you. Same line of questioning as earlier. We mentioned multiple times that the Director General was mentioned, actually. Who does this DG uh, speak to? For example, uh, who do they report to about these facts? Who is the, uh, the department? It's the uh, deputy assistant deputy uh, minister with the procurement branch. So the Mr. Laporte's predecessor, is that correct? Yes. Are you aware that the predecessor may have been aware of the DG's questioning with regards to the question, the the decision made vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, CBSA's uh, 
advice? Um, merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. That, the, that these issues were raised to the ADM level. Et pourquoi pas? Ils ont pas le directeur. And why not? Does the DG not have the duty to report to the uh, de 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 delegated assistant uh, uh, general, or is it, does somebody is something uh, just to get lost in the process? The department provides advice on potential procurement strategies. They advise the client to the department. The client department. Uh, makes the decision on whether to accept that advice or to take another other approach. Uh, in certain cases, it's not uncommon for departments to take to not take our advice to kind of prefer another approach. Ben justement, je vais en profiter. Excusez. Sorry to cut you off, but my time is short. We had the confirmation from the Auditor General that task force authorizations were signed by the department that was responsible for procurement processes. So co-signed by PSPC, which did not respect the standards that are predetermined. Why accept co-signing task authorizations and contracts that did not respect the processes that were in place? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I'm not... Um... We, as we mentioned before, we've made changes to our system to try and strengthen this. We acknowledge that it was not proper practice to have task authorizations that were too general and, and did not specify clearly the activities that be undertaken. When you say you've made changes, has anybody lost uh, their position? Because these are very serious uh, mistakes when tasks are not respected. Thank you for the question. No, nobody lost their job there were uh, a, there was advice that was sent there were uh, checklists that were implemented this was around november you have to understand also that the that pspc doesn't just work on one contract as mentioned ultimately it is the client's decision to follow our guidelines and advice or not you have the floor for two and a half minutes thank you very much mr chair i want to return now to the interesting timeline that exists between the challenge brought forward by Public uh, Service and Procurement Canada and the date to which the contract was signed. So we've heard just in the prior answers to my questions that May of 2020 is when the evidence to suggest that 0.1.51 was met in regards to the finding of Public Service and Procurement Canada as the government's central purchasing and contracting authority challenged the Canada Border Service AD for proposing and using non-competitive processes for Arrive Can and recommended various alternatives. That was in May of 2020. The contract was signed in April, or the app was launched April 29th, 2020. In between that period of time, just to clarify the facts to the Auditor General, which of these events, in terms of the including the contract date, took place first? So the email that we're referring to was May of 2020. The first contract was awarded to GC Strategies in a non, under a non-competitive process on April 8th of 2020. And then the application was launched April 29th. And now to P, PSPC, when you mounted that challenge in regards to non-competitive processes, your last answer was that you were not aware of any red flags presented to the to the department by the person who is the executive director of the business application service directorate is that correct thank you thank you mr chair um, as has been previously released there were multiple contracts with gc strategies not just one so the this may have been in relation to one of the later contracts not not the initial contract in april if, if I may, oh, I, I should, if I may, Mr. Chair, I should have finished. Um, there was a second contract awarded to GC Strategies on June 29th, 2020. So the challenge. And so is the email in relation to that, the set, the larger contract, the $20 million contract? It was it related to obviously the second one, the one that was issued on um, June 29th. It and was at that again time, a non it was again though a non-competitive contract. So there were three non-competitive contracts issued to GC st Strategies before the competitive process took place. The larger one. Yes. Yes, and so those those three contracts that were subject to the concerns issued by or the concerns raised by PC 
uh, Public Service of Procurement Canada, correct? Mr. Digitally, the yeah, concern, I'll, was, I'll, ra I'll the concern was raised between the first uh, non-competitive contract and the second one based on the... Attorneys. And that is your time, Mr. Digitally. You will have one last opportunity you, to, to wrap things up. Uh, uh, turning out to Mr. Barrett, you have the floor for five minutes. See strategies uh, does their business. They're a middleman, correct? Yes, Mr. Turmore. Are you satisfied with the selection of GC strategies with value for money for Canadians in mind? Are you satisfied? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I wouldn't be able to speak to the value for money because I did not observe the... Well, you said that they're changing processes at PSPC. Are you changing the processes because they were really good before and you want to make them worse? Or were they not good before and you're making them better? Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. As obviously we've had two reports, the one from the Office of the Procurement Ombudsman, one from the Office of the Auditor General, which has clearly pointed that there are many areas for improvement yep, and we're making time. changes to improve. So the app was supposed to cost $80,000. Were red flags raised to the minister when costs hit a million dollars? Yes or no? Mr. Chair, uh, to whose minister? To the to the minister responsible for your department. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. We put in place contracts. And for and clarity, sir, all of my questions not... have to deal with you with with your ministry that you're here on on behalf of. Uh, we put in place contracts. We were we were not project management. We did not have an awareness of what the project overall project budget is or all the totality of contracts. Did you, did you ask? So what we were the, not aware. Did you ask what the budget was? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, as a department, we are focused on what are the goods and services they need, and those were the questions we were focused okay. on providing. Those so things. it was supposed to cost eighty thousand. It hit a million. It hit five million. It hit ten million. It hit twenty-five million. It hit thirty million, forty-five, sixty, at least sixty million, um, because the paper shredders must have been running, and there's not documents to demonstrate uh, what the actual costs were uh, for this thing. Uh, it, it's been raised, of course, that it was only two people working for GC Strategies, and they were pocketing. This kind of this kind of money, you know, uh, you you talked about the value of them being able to build a team, um, you know, for for the same price that just the GC Strategies portion of of the arrive scam cost, you could hire ten public servants to work for twenty five years, and instead we got these these geniuses who are taking thirty percent. Um, of of this twenty million dollar contract and potentially two hundred and fifty eight million dollars more. Um, obviously, you said you're not going to be able to speak to the value uh, for money. We heard that from the Auditor General. It doesn't exist in this case. Um, how many other two person middlemen contractors are there that PSPC is allowing to do contracting for the government of Canada? Just the number. How many others? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. I could not comment on the numbers of uh, suppliers that are using, or if there are other suppliers uh, basically running uh, two people. Can you uh, undertake shop. to provide that information to the committee in writing after your appearance? I'll, I'll take note of, note of the question. Uh, will, will you undertake to provide the information to the committee? To the extent that we can provide the information, for sure. So that, we're gonna, that's, that's, that's an acceptable answer. We're going to register yeah. that as a yes. Mr. Mills, can the minister, your minister, get the money back that was paid out in this clear, crystal clear case of contracting abuse. To be very specific, money paid to GC Strategies for their work on the failed ARRIVE scam. Can Does the minister have the power to get that money back? Um, thank you, maybe I'll turn to our CFO to Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think the uh, normally, I think if, uh, and I can speak on behalf of our department in the situation where if our department was a, a party to a, a, a contract where we did not get services uh, that were supposed to be uh, delivered, we would absolutely have uh, the right to go after a, a party to recover the funds. So. Is is this, is, is this an example of uh, an opportunity for Canadians to get some of their money back from GC Strategies? I can't speak to the uh, particular case. I think is that, because, colleague, you is that uh, because you haven't looked or because you're not sure? Uh, so this, so I'm speaking on behalf of uh, PSBC where we 
contract services for ourselves. I think in this case, in the particular case, we're talking about GC strategies. And, we are. And, 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 and let me, I, I've got very limited time. I got 15 seconds left. They forged the credentials that they used to win the bid. If that's not a disqualifying criteria for, uh, for someone to continue to receive work, but also if it doesn't mean that we don't get the money back because they got it under false pretenses, what does? Is forgery and fraud enough for the minister to get their money back, to get uh, Canadians' money back? Yes or no? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I think that is one of the questions that is being looked at. And I think when uh, that determination is made, the uh, appropriate authorities will be uh, involved, as my, as my colleague uh, um, uh, Catherine Poulin has, has indicated. Thank you very much. That is your time. Um, turning to Mr. Hardy now, you have the floor for five minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I must say off the top that uh, I did use the ArriveCan app and it worked actually quite well for me back uh, going back and forth, at least across the American border anyway. To the, the PSP, uh, you're sitting there, you're in the hot seat. There's obviously been an imbalance between authority and accountability. You're being held to account for a lot of things right now. Do you feel in the past there's been that imbalance between your authority on the one hand and the accountability that you're having to demonstrate right now? We'll go to uh, Mr. Mills on this one. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I think that it's, it speaks to the kind of fundamental principle of accountability is that there are in procurements and in project management and in, and in the government generally, there's a large division of responsibilities and a lot, a lot of individuals. So one of the challenges of exercising accountability and answering the questions is being able to understand everyone's role in that process and, and what has happened and to be able to kind of come back and account for the activities that have happened within different departments and at different levels. Well, you know, there's, there's a difference between giving advice and giving direction. Uh, you mentioned that you're making adjustments in the way things are done. Are we moving now more to advice and away from direction, like you can follow it or not, but, or, or advice, you know, you can follow it or not, but direction, no, it has to be done this way. Which way are you headed right now? Uh, I think we're still, I think we're into, headed to a place where it's clear advice and our, and then but the, ultimately the decisions and the authority for those decisions still rests uh, with the departments that are required to buy goods and services to carry out their mandates. Oh, in your experience, okay, this is, this is one incident where things have clearly not gone as they should have. Is this systemic? Uh, when you look across the domain that uh, you know, your, your organization is, is basically being held accountable for right now, um, are there other flags? Are there other things that you're going back and having a closer look at as a result of your experience on this one? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, certainly what we're reflecting on is the difficulty of IT procurement, the difficulty of IT projects, and what are the best mechanisms to bring in external help when we need external help to be able to deliver on the IT uh, projects the government needs. We've seen across the range that IT projects are unique in the sense that they're often very transformational. They're often on the leading edge where we just do not have enough visibility and experience to be able to understand what the changes will be once we put in place these systems. So they're very hard to, to conceive, to deliver and to achieve the results on. And it's made more difficult from a procurement perspective about how do we ensure we engage the best teams to be able to work with our own people to deliver that outcome. So I think that's where we're reflecting on is ultimately, how do we deliver these complex IT projects? We're using inter a balance of internal and external resources and what's the best way to engage those external resources to that end. Mr. Bilge, are you satisfied that uh, you know the breakdown between what the app itself actually cost versus all of the other ingredients that went into implementing this, this program? Uh, you know, there would be training, there would be other, uh, you know, systems adjustments uh, in, a, in a variety, a, a patchwork quilt, in fact, of, of IT systems, you know, in the public service across the country. Um, 
were you able to determine precisely what the app itself cost? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I think as has it been spoken to by Auditor General, uh, and she can kind of add to it, I don't think any of us has the certainty on where the costs of the ultimate work that were taken in relation to RiveCan is. And I, I certainly, given that lack of clarity and precision, it would be very difficult to say this is the precise portion of the expenditure that went just for app creation and development versus integration of the application with existing systems within CBSA, training people, adaptation of those systems, building accessibility, looking at uh, other kind of security measures with respect to systems and the interface with the application. I, I would not have that precision. So uh, GC Strategies was on the uh, pre-qualified list. Um, and I don't know that anybody would ever approve a sole source contract from any organization that wasn't pre-qualified. I hope you can just nod and say, yes, that wouldn't happen. Um, but uh, when somebody doesn't take your advice, even your new and improved advice that uh, is coming as a result of this experience you're having, is it flagged? Is it moved up, up the line, up the food chain? Like are, are people say, hey, hold on, there's something going on here that could be trouble down the road. Does that happen? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I think it's really flagged if there's a feeling that they're outside the rules of procurement and that there's going to be a violation. In this case, um, there is a mechanism to use non-competitive contracts. There are, uh, you need a justification for that use of that. And so those, the, those mechanisms were used and processed. So while they did not accept our advice at the beginning, there was no, nothing to flag that they were outside of the rules of procurement. Thank you very much. That is your time. Turn now to Mr. Genuis. You have the floor for up to five minutes. Thank you, Chair. After eight years, it's clear to me that the government contracting system in Canada is badly broken. Uh, we have officials here today responsible for the department that oversees government contracting. Now, with Arrive Scam, we have a situation in which a tiny company, GC Strategies, with All no right, ability Kevin. to do it's anything, right, can get hundreds of millions in contracts and then subcontract. Uh, the Auditor General found that the process was actually rigged in favor of this company, and we heard at the Government Operations Committee that this company broke the law by systematically altering resumes in order to get deals. The Procurement Ombudsman found further that the system was built to help insiders get contracts and to push those contractors to charge the government more. Um, frankly, Clearly, these aren't just arrive scam issues. These are systematic issues. Uh, you're the department responsible for overseeing contracting. Uh, with this systematic incompetence, corruption, perhaps both uh, that we're seeing, what would you say to Canadians who look at your department and say, have you guys become totally useless given that these things could happen and, and, um, and you're supposed to be watching and, and it, they happened anyways? Mr. Chair, for the question... What I would say to Canadians is that the procurement system is very complex. It has become more complex over years from a number of drivers, international trade agreements, a number of rules. Uh, so, 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 sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just, I am going to press the point though. The, the question isn't whether or not it's complex. The question is whether your department is doing anything, whether your department is adding value. Uh, if, if you if we're, 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 we're able to allow this kind of, uh, corruption, incompetence, or both in the procurement process. If it just happened while you were while you were there, um, was your department adding any value? Was it doing anything in the process? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. What what I was about to say was, given this complexity, we have processes, uh, procurement processes that are complex to try and deal with kind of rules, regulations, and whatnot. What we are doing, and what our ep strong effort is is to make procurement simpler so it's more open to small, medium-sized enterprises across this country, particularly diverse uh, suppliers across this country. By making it more simple, making it more accessible, we'll get better value for Canadians. Okay, I, that that doesn't really answer the, the question, though. In fact, the Procurement Ombuds, Ombudsman's report uh, shows that the system was built uh, to preference insiders because you had to have pre-existing experience with the government of Canada in order to get those those uh, bids. So, so, so um, 
I'm not getting a clear answer to what your what your department does. I just maybe move, moving it up to the to the minister. Uh, what what uh, does Minister Duclo do as Minister of Procurement? Um, is he is he responsible for what happened here? Uh, if if uh, was was he seeking briefings on GC strategies? Um, what 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 is what is he doing in his role or not doing? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Typically, our procurement uh, authority kind of is delegated from the minister down to departmental officials, and the vast majority of our procurement activity is authorized, managed, and overseen by departmental officials. There would be a handful of individual procurements that would invoke the authorities of the minister for actual approval, and there'd be a number okay, of- Okay, so sorry, when, when, when was he first briefed on GC strategies then? Um, thank you for the question. I would have to take back, um, uh, take under advisement uh, Take to provide in, an answer in writing to this committee within seven days, correct? I will undertake to provide a, a response. Um, I'm not sure that I can meet seven days. It, it's, it's typically 14 before we start. Okay, for, for, before for, we for, send reminders, for, but yes. For, for 14 days. You'll provide that information? Yes. Uh, when, when Minister Duclos was briefed about ArriveCan, about GC strategies, as well as, as uh, previous ministers? Uh, will you also undertake to give the committee a complete list of all pre-qualified contractors uh, within the same timeline? Thank you for the question. Uh, you mean on the, on which which contract? Uh, which? All, all, all pre-qualified contractors, people that have the, the GC strategies process available to them. So all the supply range, who's pre-qualified on the supply arrangements? Uh, we'll you days um, briefly mr uh, th thank you uh, th these aren't just arrive can issues these are, are systematic issues um, what why did your department allow this to happen and um, and again what what value are you providing in the process you can just provide a brief answer please thank you mr chair I'm not sure uh, why our department allows what to happen We'll come back. Well, well no, Mr. Okay. Genius, I, 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 you, you started your question at the time, and I allowed you to finish it. Um, Thank you. Uh, there will be another opportunity for your one of your members, Ms. Yip. You have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Poulin, I don't believe that you were given an opportunity to answer a question earlier. Can you explain what your role is? I believe you know what your job is. Uh, merci pour la question, uh, Monsieur le Président. So, um, one of my role is certainly to uh, over thank you mm -hmm. various processes, uh, starting from due diligence processes up to an administrative investigation uh, into the department, and it's also to put uh, together a framework of preventive, detective, and reactive measures to any information that are brought to our our attention that may suggest. Uh, that we have issues uh, or in the processes or up to wrongdoing. So we're taking that information and we have multiple teams that are working on that. We're taking this information, take it seriously. We are validating first if the allegation has some uh, other evidence that will support it. And uh, when we reach that first step, uh, and we think that there's uh, enough material to trigger an administrative uh, investigation, we're doing so. So we have a great team of uh, internal investigators within the departments uh, that are going through all the information that they have. And upon completion, they are issuing a report to confirm or infirm if the allegation were proven to be uh, right or if uh, there was nothing to be seen. As soon as we are uh, identifying some uh, element of criminality, we are referring uh, those uh, elements to the RCMP in order for them to decide if they will launch a criminal investigation into the matter. As it was also discussed, 
upon completion of a thorough analysis that demonstrate that we have been overcharged, overbilled, that there was some element for which we have paid too much, we have the ability to recover the funds from the suppliers, and it's in our regular practice to do so. So, and it's important for us to take all that information, the outcome of those reports, the great recommendations that have been made, and to make sure that we understand uh, even after that, what we can change and improve to make that framework of prevention, detection and reaction even more efficient in order to avoid the repetition of such events. So in a nutshell, it's uh, one of the responsibility uh, under my area. Any other responsibilities mm -hmm. that we should be aware of? So yes, we, uh, I have many uh, responsibility. I'm also having the chief security officer responsibility, which is talking about the security of people, information and assets within the government. So we also take seriously all. And, and another area of responsibility will be the security in contracts for the government of Canada. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mills, names of contractors were being named in the competitive process, and then different people completed the work. Can you elaborate on what happened? Uh, as I mentioned previous, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the question. As I alluded previously, uh, there are uh, times when there is a procurement process, and we will ask for certain le levels of IT skills or or even in architecture and engineering projects, for instance, we will actually see a team that is proposed uh, for a number of reasons. There can be a delay between the time that the contract is awarded and the work is actually undertaken. And in that time, certain of those resources are no longer available. In some cases, people will actually leave firms, so the firm has <laughs> to replace them. In other cases, the firm uh, isn't sure that they've won and they may deploy those those resources to another project. So in those cases, they would be required to submit uh, for approval by the government alternative resources and they would have to demonstrate that they meet the same skill uh, or you have more uh, capability than those that originally proposed. So just so I understand, um, does being named as part of the bid process mean that the person was paid? Uh, no, the persons were only paid once they did work uh, and that uh, that work was valid, validated. Um, does the task authorization and work um, trigger, does that trigger the payment? So the, the task authorization would typically identify the, resor the specific resources doing the work, their rates of pay and what work is to be done. And then they would submit invoices demonstrating that the work was completed by those individuals at those rates. So, that is your time, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, Madame Sinclair -Degagné. Next, Ms. Sinclair Degagné for two and a half minutes. Thank you. Let's look at what happened during the pandemic. Let's take Just Arrive Can as an example. One might be tempted to think that the problem with the CBSA uh, is that, they, well, that they had the, mo the largest chunk of the responsibility, sure. But there is there are two reports here of the Ombudsman and the Auditor General. The same procurement problem was detected at Service Canada with a lack of uh, documentation for, very, for Microsoft and so on that happened at ArriveCan, also with uh, Public uh, Health Canada. And the same thing was um, the same thing happened uh, with KPMG with uh, giving them con uh, contracts. And so this is something that happened a lot during uh, the pandemic. So 3000 contracts were allotted without a competitive process during the pandemic. So in 2017, before the pandemic, that is when this kind of pro this uh, kind of contract started to be uh, given. And so this happened before the pandemic. How do you explain such an explosion of non-competitive contracts being awarded? And in this supposedly calm period, how do you explain that there were so many non-competitive contracts and for uh, uh, amounts that were not under 25,000 as they should have been? Merci pour la question, 
Thank you for the question. 80% of our contracts are an audible for the interpreter. That's not a proper response. We're talking about 3,000 contracts during the pandemic and thousands after the pandemic. You're saying 80% of the contracts are competitive. Well, first of all, this is an absurd answer. Second, it does not answer my question at all. How come so many contracts that are non-competitive were awarded and that do not demonstrate that uh, taxpayers see their money is spent in a in a in a smart way well i don't want us to uh you know stigmatize the non-competitive contracts there could be very many reasons behind that for example patents uh, sometimes there are other suppliers that can do the work so that 20 percent exists and these are uh, justifications that are uh, that already exist, but those justifications are missing in both of these reports. Uh, that's what is said. So maybe there are good reasons, but how come the taxpayer is not aware of them? I'm sorry, I thought we meant all of the contracts that have been awarded over a number of years, and so that's what I was answering to. I'm sorry, uh, your time is up. Or for two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I believe that you know Canadians who are watching this and who are seeing the proceedings of this uh, very troubling scenario are met with partly grief and sadness, but also anger, as am I, to the extreme lack of oversight that this project seemed to have taken from the very beginning. There was a lack of a governance system. We've seen fingers pointed across the board between Public Health Agency of Canada and the CBSA. In addition to that, we see red flags being raised by the Public Service and Procurement Canada. All of this is to say that at the end of it, we still see a loss for value for Canadian taxpayers. An immense failure and an immense disappointment for me uh, and for Canadians everywhere, especially at a time when you know costs are soaring, things are expensive. This hits doubly hard for Canadians to know that our public service, in particular, the public service that's uh, and procurement um, services, uh, an organization meant to protect Canadians, meant to ensure value for money, wasn't there when we needed them most. I think that is the, the greatest level of failure that uh, Canadians uh, across the country, I'm, I'm certain, will find unity on. It's, however, a situation that one is, I think, in some cases, predictable as well. We know that when we don't, and it was mentioned many times, not just in this committee, but in previous committees, that when we don't actually invest in the 21st century solutions that are required for IT specialists and procurement within the government, that vulnerability exists, and that predominant vulnerability continues to exist, whether that was the Phoenix Pay System in the previous administration, the previous government, or other GC strategies now. The vulnerability is the same that the government does not have the ability to secure the kind of IT specialists in the country that are required to ensure good work and to ensure the value for money is met. This vulnerability is critical to me and one that I want to be able to explore and be able to actually fix as a systematic condition of this ongoing tragedy. I don't want to see this continue to happen. We need to actually become more competitive when it comes to securing of IT specialists within the government, and we need to actually have the retention strategies like the, the Public Service Alliance of Canada has often talked about, the important ability to secure that talent, to retain that talent, and then to execute that talent in a way that actually provides value for money at the rate that's discussed in this report. Mr. Mills, any final comment on your actions to ensure that this problem, this incredibly difficult and generational systematic problem is fixed with, uh, with the remaining time I have, please. And I'm sure, Mr. Ejlemen, <clears throat> your department's response. <laughs> yes, sorry, Chair. Um, Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I think as we move increasingly into a data-driven digital age, uh, it's important that public servants across all different categories have a much stronger digital background. And I think that's one of the areas that we're really focused on is what do we need to do in terms of the digital competency across our, our labor force and particularly those that are specifically in the IT uh, space and, and thinking through with our IT departments where are the, the core competencies that we need and what are the kind of the, the training and development programs that we need going forward in a sustainable manner to make sure that we're always upskilling our IT professionals. Thank you very much. Uh, look, I'm, I'm just using my discretion. I want to go back to Nathalie who asked a question. It was misunderstood. There was translation. So, Mr. Madame Tegladegagne, pouvez-vous poser votre question encore? 
Ms. Degagny, you can ask your question again to Mr. Laporte briefly, please. Thank you for allowing me to clarify. Mr. Laporte, there were thousands of contracts that were awarded in a non-competitive manner, and therefore it's difficult to believe that all of those contracts were awarded for reasons that are, one, totally legitimate, and second, everything leads us to believe, according to the reports of the Ombud and the Auditor General, that no guarantee is given to Quebecers and Canadians that that money is being spent properly. What ex how do you explain the amount of the explosion of, of uh, contracts since 2007? There's a validity of uh, certain contracts. I talked about non-competitive contracts. Sometimes there are good reasons. For example, according to uh, trade agreements, it allows uh, for the government to proceed in a non-competitive manner when there's an, there are emergencies. Just to, to take position on the justifications or to see if the the contracts were awarded in a non-competitive uh, way, I'd need more context. It's not that I don't want to answer, but I do need more background information. On to Mr. Barrett. We need to Five minutes, please. In a report, the Auditor General said, quote, our review of task authorizations that were issued by the Canada Border Service Agency and co-signed by Public Service and Procurement Canada, we found two resources being charged at the rate that required a minimum of 10 years of experience, even though the resources did not have this level of experience, end quote. Um, in, in a word, what would you, or, or a phrase, how would you characterize that, Mr. Mills? Is that an example of bait and switch, or is that fraud? What is that? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. Certainly, it is a requirement of those that are administering those contracts to ensure that the people being put forward meet the minimum requirements. So in that case, uh, they should have verified that if the requirement was 10 years that the so so, had it. so it's fraud they lied um about the workers experience to charge a higher rate right uh, thank you mr chair i'm not in a position to opine whether it's fraud but it's a, are you in a position to say whether or not it was honest my question is is it a lie because um, the, the the auditor general wasn't opining she she an, analyzed the information and determined that what uh, what was said, what was signed off on was not true. A minimum of 10 years experience that did not exist. So is that honest or dishonest? Um, again, thank you, Mr. Chair, but I would not be able to opine whether honesty or dishonesty or administrative error. Okay. Um, well, that might be part of the problem. If we have a, a basic misunderstanding of what is honest and what is dishonest, I think that um, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should take a, a separate look at that. 76% of the time, the procurement ombuds found that named resources did not have, uh, did not do the work um, that was stated at the skill level uh, that was required. You said that the skill level of replacement workers had to match that of the workers who were originally authorized to do the work. Has an audit or review been done to ensure that that is the case, having just noted that there was fraud committed uh, as outlined by the Auditor General in the case I mentioned? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do believe the procurement ombudsman said 76% of names that were proposed at the bidding stage did not subsequently do work or, or have work filled against it. Uh, this is something that we are very focused with in terms of when uh, people are being put, proposed so that we ensure that those being proposed are mo right. most when, likely to do the, when the work. When, and they, bait, when they, they bait do the, the hook, when they bait the hook with the skill set that they say that they're offering, and then they switch it out and they make sure that they get the maximum price possible and the Canadians get the least value possible. This is something that we would expect that uh, your department is safeguarding against. Ms. Hogan, is it common practice across government contracting that high price consultants do carry out a bait and switch as has been identified in the uh, procurement ombudsman's work where they present experienced workers to get the contract and charge a higher rate when they actually swap them out for less experienced workers that can pay less and then they pocket the difference. Well, I can't comment on whether it's common practice. I can tell you that we saw it in some of the samples that we looked at where an individual, um, the, the contract called for 10 years of experience or more and that's the individual who performed the work was not that way. But there is a mechanism in place in the public service when an individual who's put forward under a contract or TAF authorization needs to be switched and, and it, that should have happened and right. we did not see that happening. Thank you very much. My time to Mr. Brock, please. You have a minute and a half. To the Auditor General, does the PSPC need a court order from the RCMP to share their findings and suspicions? 
Um, it's my understanding that anyone can refer a matter to law enforcement, but it, typically we wait for law enforcement to ask us for a production order to provide sure. evidence. And there'd be nothing stopping them from doing that today, for instance, would there? To share their suspicions? No, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Now, only under a Justin Trudeau government would public servants get a bonus for failing so badly. It's been discovered that PHAC paid out $340,000 in bonuses. How much in hundreds of thousands of dollars were paid out to PSPC? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I do not have the specific number about how much performance pay was paid out to executives. It's a normal part of the compensation package for executives within the government of Canada. And it's paid were bonuses into... paid out during the Arrive scam fiasco, yes or no? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. During the years of the COVID re government's COVID response, there were executives within the Department of uh, PSPC that did receive performance uh, pay. Did uh, Deputy that pay Minister has been published on the website? And did Deputy Minister Reza receive a bonus? Um, <coughs> Mr. Mr. Uh, President, I would not be able to speak to. And you'll provide to the committee case. details of who received bonuses and what quantum, please, within 17 or within 14 days. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have already provided information on the performance pay that is paid by our department is publicly available uh, on the website. And we'll provide the links for that information. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that is your time, Mr. Brock. Turning now to Ms. Bradford, you have the uh, the floor. I will say just that I, I recognize the, the response. I believe I, I think it is publicly available and I appreciate getting those links from you uh, forthwith. Thank you. Ms. Bradford, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, returning to Ms. Poulin, thank you for clarifying your responsibilities and how the oversight works in your department. Um, now, you did mention that you do have the authority to be able to take action to recover funds if you feel you've been overcharged for something. Will you be doing that in this particular case? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So we will have to uh, interact with uh, CBSA to see if they need help in completing the work because one of the points that I mentioned is that in order to do so, we need to finalize analysis that will demonstrate it, that we have been talking about the government overcharge or, of, of, or, or overbuild, and we need to quantify that amount because it will be important to be able to prove that those events as occur and to associate a number with it. So recognizing that uh, CBSA as the invoices, the timesheet, uh, it will be uh, for us to see if they need or they require help in order to complete that work and upon completion, uh, to share best practices and how uh, they can recover that those funds from their contracts. Are you confident that they do have the invoices and timesheets to be able to track that? My understanding is that uh, when you manage a contract, you have access to the, the invoices and the timesheets associated with the contract. So are you currently working with them on that now? Is that process underway? Um, I think there's a lot of process on the way within CBSA. Uh, at this moment, we are not providing support in that specific area of the work. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Mills, clearly there are security considerations to be taken into account when the government contracts with the private sector to work on behalf of the government. What does PSPC do to ensure that the contractors and subcontractors have valid security clearances on file prior to starting any work? And how does that process work? Uh, thank you for the question. I'll turn to Catherine Poulin, who's actually oh. responsible for this. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, contract security program responsibility felt under my authority. So we're doing many things to make sure that this is occurring. So first, we're working with, uh, with the client departments to uh, identify uh, their needs in terms of security for the specific contracts that they are uh, they want to put forward. So it's super important to identify this as, as the outset, so at the beginning of the work, to properly identify the security requirements of the contract that will be issued. So when this, this is established uh, between uh, discussion with the, um, with the client and with the procurement authority, uh, we are starting by doing the security clearance of an organization. So in order to, 
to contract uh, with the government when there are security requirements, you need to hold a designated security clearance for your organization. So we're looking at many aspects. We are looking at key senior officials. We also uh, ask the supplier to identify a chief security officer. And once uh, they get that security clearance for their organization, it's where we can start clearing the employees that will work under those contracts. So an employee can only be clear up to the level of an organization. So if the organization is having a secret clearance, we cannot clear the employees up to top secret clearance, for example. And then we're working with procurement authorities to make sure that we will um, include in the contracts the proper security clause to monitor the security requirement throughout the life of the contract. Uh, and it's also important to note that uh, those security clauses needs to be uh, also put in the subcontractor. So if the prime contractor is using subcontractor as part of his work, uh, the subcontracting uh, contracts need to also have the same clauses as the prime contractor clause. And then finally, uh, in doing the work, so let's assume that the contract has been awarded and there are security requirements, it will be the responsibility of the contractor to make sure that the uh, resource that are working under that contract have the proper security clearances to work on that contract. And if they add resources during the management of the contract, that those people also have the proper security clearances. So it's how we make sure that uh, security requirements are taken care of. The security certificates for the subcontractors who carried out the work on the arrive can weren't properly kept with the appropriate file, which is an, as, an issue for both PSBC and C, CBSA. Um, so has that been addressed? And can you confirm that every subcontractor who worked on this file did in fact have the appropriate security clearance? So thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So as it was mentioned uh, in the Auditor General reports, uh, there's a, a greater need for documentation. So we're working in partnership with clients and procurement to make sure that uh, the contracts with those security clauses will be shared with us moving forward. This will allow us to make sure that the final version of the, question, the contract as the proper security clearances. Also to your second question, um, I think it was note, uh, and I don't remember if it's in the AG report on the OPPO report, uh, that's, that a subcontractor may have used unclear resources. So it was put to our attention at the beginning of January that some resources of a subcontractor uh, were not having the proper security clearances. Uh, we take uh, such allegation very seriously, and we are looking into the security compliance of all the parties involved within those allegations at this time. And thank you very much. That is our time for today. I want to thank Ms. Hogan and your team for being here uh, yet again today. Mr. Mills as well for you and your your, your team uh, being here today as well, asking, asking some questions. Uh, I believe um, that is it uh, for today. Uh, I, I don't think I'll have any opposition to adjourning this meeting so we can all get uh, get back to work. So thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned.